<laughs> Patches After Dark, unfiltered and uncensored talk from young alumni of historically black colleges and universities. Thank you for joining us on the Howard University Radio Network Series 142 HBC Radio. Uh, joining us tonight, uh, or is the Morganite and Tiff, uh, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps not getting thrown off the show. Um, so and here we are. A, a lot of things. <laughs> A lot of things. To I'm get, on the show. A lot of things to get into tonight. Um, we are on the heels of HBCU week. Uh, and this was a big deal because uh, not just the, the, the scope and scale of the conference itself, but this was the first time in several years uh, over the course of two administrations that the president made remarks. So we had Donald Trump uh, to bring remarks to the conference and attendees. If you look at the coverage and you look at some of the footage of it, people were there, uh, but they weren't there for it. If you get my drift, um, very little applause, <laughs> very little feedback, um, no booing or anything like that. But I think that the the crowd made a statement of displeasure with his presence there. Um, his remarks itself were to be expected, uh, scripted testament to the history of HBCUs, the value of their contributions to the country um and the the breaking news out of that were or was remarks on saying we're going to you know roll back uh, some regulations on loans that are available to hbcus that typically had not been available to private faith-based schools we're going to roll those back so now you can have some access to capital funding um and then some some fallout from that particularly from uh dillard president walter kimbrough but first let's get you two uh on the record to uh, give your thoughts on particularly the president's remarks as that was the most front facing part of the conference. Um, and then the idea of this, this annual convening and actually what it produces for the sector overall, Tiffany. Oh, why ORS can't go for it? Because first of all, you are an HBCU ambassador as a student. Um, so shockingly, you were not in attendance at your conference. Um, <laughs> perhaps you were not there because Amarosa was not present. So you're boycotting. <laughs> Um, but you still are aligned with the uh, White House HBCU All Stars program, so we will we will defer to you as a as a All Star alumna. First of all, I would like to say you have a wild imagination. That's one. <laughs> Two, I would like to say that the program that I was part of does not exist anymore. Okay, maybe you can link my article. <laughs> In, in 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 the post somewhere below we'll we'll see about that, that article is years old will not be resurfaced unlike david wilson who links the articles from three years ago <laughs> we will not be doing that flex bomb flex bomb <laughs> flex bomb <laughs> flex bomb my hits, okay we can run my hits what, what did you think about the conference this year specifically Sir, about trump's remarks i actually um was working at my HBCU, because I am employed by one, mm -hmm. and I wasn't there. And to my understanding, nobody else from my institution was there. So <laughs> I would, I would not. We present. were busy working. Excellent. Okay. We were working. Okay. For the students of the Commonwealth. Noted. Um, so I actually did not have time to watch the remarks. Um, I'm glad I didn't because having to read. The transcript was tough because mm -hmm. um, I could still hear and see him in my mind's eye. And that was like troubling for me. But it was really basic. And like when you have the opportunity to have talked with the people that work with the uh, initiative and the opportunity that uh, the opportunity to converse with the people who are the liaison to the initiative from the White House it literally is basic. He thank he thank uh, Jaron. Jaron. There was nothing. Jaron. Mm. Well, yeah, I knew that because of apostrophe. You okay? You're right. Jaron, who's a fellow Howard alum, he thanked him, but it's like okay, what and else? He shouted out people who are on the people the president's board of advisors. Okay, and what else? The people that made it possible for the initiative from 2017 to be a thing okay and what else okay so the new thing was the uh the faith-based situation but all all i thought about when i like read that new quote new thing was what about all the other things or all the other 
forms of funding and contracts that we technically have equitable access to do we actually get those i don't know and that well it's not i don't know we complain about not getting enough funding or federal contracts even though they're technically made available to us so is this just going to be part of more lip service to the community or no i don't know yet i would like to think that it's going to be more than lip service but again well they got a record so far i mean it's hard when and I, we've been talking about this we've been writing it it is hard to reconcile trump and his rhetoric and then the actual deliverables of the administration so i think the tension is good though because that that helps you to to keep track and keep in check what your resistance looks like and what he says on the daily versus what his policy does because you you really can't let it slide so like right you can't let you can't let some of the things that he says slide but then when you try to say okay well here's a credible we have to credibly say yes this happened and it helps our schools nobody wants to hear that so right. it's it's but, not but it's again, not the point about being a Trump out. fan. It's it's about it's about being honest on both targets of this yes. of this conversation. Yes, but again, shout out to people like Niles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, who who are always going to say, Hey, no, uh uh-uh, no, that's not enough. Because he did XYZ. Like that's that's not enough. Y'all gonna stop trying to defend this man just because he did XYZ. And I I do think that tension is good. We need that to preserve ourselves for the record. Wars, what did you think about the remarks and I guess the the resulting coverage? I mean, I thought his remarks were were, were on point with what something that Paris Denard or or someone else from from TMCF <laughs> wrote for him. Um, I think he definitely got some feedback from UNCF and TMCF before he spoke. Um, I think whoever's in his black circle definitely gave him some things to highlight and he did that which is what he's supposed to do um i thought the initiative and and not the initiative but kind of listening to ban um with the way that funding is received by faith-based institutions i think is going to be beneficial if it you know plays out the way that it's supposed to uh but overall i mean i was unimpressed i mean i'm always i was unimpressed I'm always unimpressed though, but because <laughs> right, I was going to say you're always unimpressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like so. I mean, I think that I think that unfortunately, there's a lot of conversation right now about HBCUs. It's a really hot topic with the presidential, um, you know, debate on the Democratic side, um, with this quote unquote ADOS movement, with the clips going around talking about giving into HBCUs and HBCUs and HBCUs. I think it's really a hot topic right now, but. When you we talk about equitable funding, we talk about really feeding into these endowments and the things that need to happen, they don't. But I also disagree with some of what Kimbro has said in his remarks, and, and I think that a lot of HBCU presidents, in my opinion, put too much of an emphasis on this initiative and trying to lobby the president. And they, it, it obviously is good PR to come out and say he didn't listen to us, that our time our time was cut all this good stuff. That all sounds good. And we all know Kimbrough's great at promoting himself and promoting himself. So with that being said, oh um, <laughs> I, I think that, I think that it's important that we, we keep in mind that uh, there are other ways to do this. I think, uh, Will says it best over, over HBCU money. Um, you know, there are other ways that, the, uh, that HBCU presidents can engage DOE and engage the white house in ways that aren't, um, so public, um, that allow us to get some things done that could be good publicity for Trump and for the president. But I don't think we've gone about it the right way. And I think this initiative and the way it went for HBCU week was a prime example of that because things went extremely well from what I can see with uh, the partnership with Google, with HBCU house, with some of the partnerships uh, are going to, coinciding with uh, CBC. A lot of great things were happening. A lot of great conversations were had. Absolutely. A lot of great progress was made. Talkies. Angela rise, Angela rise, be, be you know, BET event over at um, over at Howard Theater. Like there's a lot of good things going along that uh, coincided with HBCU Week. I think one of the the down points of that was HBCU president's engagement with the administration. See now, here's here's what I'll say about that. No matter who's in office, the the act of being in office and executing the function of public office is political by nature. So everything you you do 
is to justify being elected to that position and is ju- is to justify your party or yourself remaining in that position. So when we say, you know, we, we shouldn't have these these moments of engagement, you know, the, the president shouldn't have visited the Oval Office and, you know, we got used and we got played and, you know, a lot of this stuff. I, I understand it. I do understand it from a lot of levels, cultural um, and, and racial, to be honest with you. But if we're talking about political and this, that's all this is. This is politics. Like you do things to show a demographic uh, whose vote that you need. Hey, look, vote for me because look what I did for you. Um, and the HBCU presidents have to play a role in that. They have to they have to be apolitical in terms of who will, they will work with, but they have to be politically charged and how effective they can work with everybody or how effectively. So, you know, I, I said from when we were in the Oval Office, you got to do this. That's politics. I said the same thing. You know, some people said, you know, why is Trump making remarks at our conference? It ain't your conference. It's the White House's conference. Who runs the White House? Right. <laughs> no, no, I, and, and I totally agree. I think I think I agree with you even more in the sense that that's why I think the president should shut up personally. And I mean, I hate to say, say that so directly, but oh, yeah. we're supposed to be apolitical. We're supposed to, you know, I think I think Tiffany's alma mater's president, Wayne, plays it extremely perfect. He never goes too far right. Mm-hmm. He never goes too far left. He understands that he operates within a circle of public funding private funding yep. and dealing directly with DOE. So he understands that presidents come and go. He plans to be at Howard for a very long time. So it would behoove him to stay within the middle. And in my opinion, that is where our president should, should stay. I made a comment about Walter Kimbrough because I think that he gets too far political. He uses his campus and his position as a political pedestal to speak on different things, which is fine. His editorials and op-eds are nice just like the president in Baltimore right now. But I don't think it plays, I don't think it plays to the benefit of the either campus. And as a Morgan state alumni, I can tell you it plays to our benefit because it, 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 it creates an environment in which you believe these presidents are literally doing everything they can to ensure their campuses are, are running at, at full speed and that the president and what the white house and DOE is doing is just the one last thing we need to get over the hump and that's not the case. Now, let me in say New Orleans and in Baltimore. There's more you want to do. Uh, now, let me say in response to that, because I, I tend to agree with you on a personal level, my personal politics. But here's what I would say up up here in Baltimore. We don't care what. Well, at least a number of us, many of us don't care what David Wilson has to say politically. Is it the old school grizzly bears who don't care? The grizzlies don't care. Okay. Um, the bears may care. Um, now, 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 <laughs> now, let me say uh, in New Orleans, I don't know if that's the case. It could be that, you know, Dr. Kimbrough is getting pressure from black legislators. Yo, you need to you need to call this out. It could be that his campus and his alumni are are pressuring him. You need to call this out. We don't like him. We don't like him. We don't like him. So it could be that, you know, he's very front facing in his politics. But that that's could a- that could be a statement that a lot of people behind him that helped to sustain the campus are, are pushing him to make. And, it, and it's interesting because he remember Dillard hosted that 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 debate that had, uh, you know, that Republican. Candace debate. Owens. Right. Well, yeah. he's, well that, he also. Had, right. And he also, had, he also had David Duke. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah. and the issue was <laughs> and, and he put it perfectly. He said, hey, look, this is a debate. I'm in a, I'm in a Republican state. This is a debate that whoever wins it is going to be my elected official. I have to be willing to 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 show that I want to work with the, the the state government mechanism, regardless of who's in the seat. So I I respected it. I respected his G for that. I mean, now when you come out and make statements and say, "Well, I don't know if this policy works, and I don't know if this function works," I, I mean, I get it. I mean, but is that the politically best way to go? But I understand it, and I more understand it if you're one of those places where people are forcing you to take stands. Texas Southern may be another one. I can't for the life of me understand why Republican speakers are getting chased off the campus, but you got the Democratic National Debate on campus. I understand well, it if, you're, if your people if your people they want that, that's fine. But no, you're going to pay you're going to pay a political price. 
So they, they, they had they had Ted Cruz play a basketball game in the gym. They didn't run him off. I think the issue. I think they, <laughs> when they when they ran off the guy who's a um, who's a Harris County board member, I believe at the law school, mm-hmm. I think that was a bit of a different situation than, because again, they had Ted Cruz like the next, like around the same time. Mm-hmm. So I think I think that was a bit more of a, just, just to defend TSU a little bit, because I live down here. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that was a bit more of an independent situation, but I do agree in that almost all of our schools are Republican states. I mean, how many how many of our schools have Democratic governors? Not right. even Maryland has Democratic governors. Right. So for, this, is, this is the schools in Virginia for the most part, I can think of. So I think all of us have to operate in that space, but even to agree with Tiffany a little bit here, I think that there is there is a place and a time to be there and a way to be there. And I agree with them being there. I just don't agree with the headlines coming out of it from some of the presidents because I think that it it, it doesn't it doesn't add to more healthy debate. Because at the end of the day, there's a large chance he could win reelection, mm-hmm. and we need to continue to build. We could have another five years consecutively of this of, of this administration, right. not just with him. We don't you know. DeVos may she may retire. She may she may not come back. It's a lot to talk about different things. So we need to make sure we're in good we're in good positioning, good positions before that time comes. So there's another aspect that leaders could take, and I know we expect our HBCD presidents to just lead like from the front. But when you think about how agendas are made and how it takes the people to decide that there is an issue and they bring it to their leadership's position, I, I think, or uh, forefront of their agenda, trying to get it on the agenda. I think that's where HBCU leaders should show up, not leading in terms of, hey, my people said X, Y, Z. It's this happens. It's baking for a while. Then the president figures out, oh, shoot, this is happening. What am I going to do? What can I do? And then. But see, I think it, that's a that's a slippery slope for presidents. And I'll say this before we take our first break. You know that colleges and universities, period, black or white. That's where kids or students are finding themselves politically and personally. Yes. So they waiting for the, the stuff to pop off. They, yes. they they're they're literally on campus. Like, give me a reason to protest and not go to class. Yes. Right? This is particular at HBCUs. Because of our lineage and our DNA of it's a laboratory of activism, like, right, so I right, think that right, right. the That's presidents are aware. You don't want to be you don't want to be the one that that makes a politically astute statement or or takes a position, and the students jump all over you. Now you can survive students jumping all over you because every president knows there's always a break in the action. Y'all can be mad at me all fall semester. Eventually, all y'all going home for Christmas. And when we come back, y'all will have forgotten it. Y'all can be mad at me all spring semester. Eventually, y'all Negroes going to graduate and go home for the summer. So there's always a pause where you can survive a student-based or a student-led crisis. And not a crisis of, you know, we got some infrastructure issues or there's crime. I'm talking about a crisis of the students are not happy with you. You can survive that because there'll be a pause. But when it when it becomes a situation where you you take a position and you don't have to, that's when it start you start getting the the, the the name of oh president is such and such president X Y and Z is such and such, and that can carry you for four to six years because if you get if you if you dip in that pool too much, if you make too many political statements one way or another. Then you start to get the, the the label of oh you're an agent of politics, and you do it either for the money or for the governor's favor or whatever, and you right. don't want and that either. So you should be only realistically, if it, if this was a perfect world, we're talking about talking about things that directly impact your students in the community that your your school is in. So if this was Walter Kimbrough talking about. Hmm, this is what the governor is saying and doing. Okay, this is what my my leg or his legislators are doing. Okay, I can see that. Okay, because hey, you really do have to work with these people. But if it's outside and or above that, then maybe 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 you should just let these students do what they're going to do. 
Yeah. Enough about HBC Week. When we come back, uh, going to have some conversation about uh, Jamel's uh, landmark piece in the Atlantic on if black athletes should migrate to HBCUs. That just after dark. We'll be right back. Not just after dark, and we're back uh, talking about accreditation issues at an unknown school off air. Uh, but we're back to talk about uh, a really significant piece uh, which came out in the Atlantic. What was that last week? Uh, from notable journalists and commentator Jamel Hill. Uh, this is centered around a topic that has has been getting attention for years and years and years now. Should black athletes take their talents, their brand, and the money that comes along with those? to HBCUs and the premise of her argument was the NCAA and all of its member schools, particularly in the power five conferences have been making billions and billions in revenue off the backs, literally off the backs of uh, male and female black athletes um, who go on to professional careers, who enjoy great collegiate success. Um, they pack stadiums of a hundred thousand people or more. Um, they sell jerseys, they sell beer, they do all this stuff. They don't get paid for it. In the meanwhile, uh, HBCUs in the communities that surround them financially struggling in a lot of cases. And what would happen if these same talented black athletes went to HBCUs? Could that revenue transfer over uh, to black college communities and help galvanize, uh, you know, identity and, and financial empowerment around these schools, particularly in the athletic vein? So uh, Tiff doesn't care about sports. Uh, she's getting boxed out of this conversation. That is not true. Um, the only reason she's a part of it is because Jamel Hill is from Detroit. Uh, we don't care about that. Um, you know what? So, Orz, I would ask you, your your thoughts on this are a little bit different from the, the general dialogue that's been taking place. So what did you think first about the article and then the premise of black athletes uh, being centered more around the HBCU community? So I liked the article. I didn't like her response as much. She wrote a response to maybe maybe two three days later. Mm -hmm. I wasn't too into that one, mm -hmm. but I was in. I was into the original article and his premise. Also, shout out to Ben Watson. That was great content with him taking down Laura Ingram. Yeah, I did see that. Really enjoy seeing her. Mm -hmm. I really enjoy seeing her shake. Mm -hmm. Always fun. Um, but no, I think the article was good. I think that what she said is what many other people have said. I feel like you've written on it. I feel like Stephen Gaither at HBCU Game Day has written on it. So. She just has a bigger platform. So mm -hmm. I don't want to give her so much credit without giving credit to people who also operate in the space who speak about it. Um, and I think even better ways than she has. And again, I know that obviously she has to make things that are entertaining to be able to be read in the Atlantic and so forth and so on. So she didn't really get nitty gritty in terms of the facts, talking about student fees and all different things. Um, but I thought it was good. I think that part of the part of my issue is that I'm not. And again, I'm someone who's a big football fan. My brother is a MEAC football player right now. So I, I can't I can't sit here with a straight face and say I don't care about football at all. But I think that that's a space where we spend too much time and money in the agency you face personally. I think we spend a lot of our time worrying about football. And to me, I think it's a waste of time. I think that HBCU should take, a, should take the, the seat like Georgetown does. Like Georgetown is in D.C. There has never been strong football in terms of collegiately in the Mid-Atlantic region. The best time Maryland ever had was probably in 01 with Chris Perry returning Ralph kicks. With, Fre <laughs> with Ralph Friedman was still there. Yeah. And they still and they still didn't win nothing. They got to the Orange Bowl mm -hmm. and got blown out by Florida. So, <laughs> so it, it's not our thing. But we've won national championships at Maryland, even though, I don't, even though I don't mess with Maryland like that. I'm a Georgetown fan. But at Maryland and Georgetown, Coppin had a great run. Morgan's had strong runs. Uh, UVA just won a ring, and they got a bunch of DC folks on the team. Mm -hmm. So I think that I think that HBCUs are positioned one because basketball is a sport that doesn't require as many people to be good. Mm -hmm. Two, you don't need them in school for three years to make to make the benefit. And four, I mean, you don't the facil facilities in basketball don't matter. Like it doesn't matter what it, it, weight rooms don't matter in <laughs> in basketball. Mm -hmm. Practice facilities don't matter in basketball. You practice on the same court you play on. Like there's no, we don't need to spend nearly the amount of money. So I think that if HBCUs took the premise of this article and applied it to basketball, and we went D three or D two or whatever in football, like Georgetown, and then had top tier went all in on D one basketball, we could be competitive. I mean if you have if you have a you have a squad that's going 
you know, 30 and 5 and the MEAC, they deserve a higher seed than a 16. Our issue is that we never can have a team that's that good. Our best teams may lose 10, 12 games. So I think that if we apply this energy to basketball, men's and women's, and we pull some money back from football, go D2, go D3, go NIAA, excuse me, NAIA, I think that we can be successful because that's what Georgetown University has done. Now, again, they've had some, some down years, but for decades and centuries, they've been a – they've had a football team, but it's not a real football team. It's you no know, D3 or – that's a D1 now, but they were D3 for a long time, and they had top-tier basketball. I think that that's where we, need, we, should, we should go. We should go top-tier basketball and let the football go. I've always said from the beginning, there's a reason why 30 years after the fact, the CIAA is still more popular than the MEAC. Now, you could say that the MEAC spinoff teams were the popular CIAA teams, and that's why they moved up and created their Division One thing. But the CIAA as a tournament, the affinity to that still remains popular. And part of it is the geography. Part of it is you don't have to travel far to see good rivalries. You don't have to travel far to see teams um that are you know competitive within competitive balance and range of each other and it still means something everybody's in carolina and virginia the MEAC now you know division one we're all up and down the east coast so you don't you don't have a chance to galvanize the conference as a fan base more to the point in moving up that way you still you don't have an opportunity or you don't have any system or infrastructure in place to guarantee that every single one of your schools is going to be competitive at least with d2 you know Everybody's going to have a small gym with no AC. <laughs> Everybody is going to be geographically <laughs> proximate for the most part. So we can save on travel and put more back into the program and recruiting people um, and in-state talent and building that in-state fan base. But there's no way that you can make you can make uh, South Carolina State be competitive. There's nothing the MEAC can do. There's nothing the other member schools can do to force them to spend more money on sports or to spend more wisely on sports. And there's nothing you can do to make them great in basketball in South Carolina. Football, yeah. They're not touching Coppin and Morgan in basketball. We just we just got a basketball city. There's nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it. So, I mean, to that end, I, 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 I totally agree with you, Oars. Like, the, the, we got to rethink the way that we do sports. But then but then to the larger point of, you know, should, should black athletes go to HBCUs? Her point was well taken. And I'm so grateful that she used her platform to make that kind of a statement. But here's the thing. If somebody told her, and I'm not I'm not challenging her or questioning her, Draymond Green got a choice between Michigan State, where he's from. He grew up in Michigan. Flint, right? Or was it Saginaw? Saginaw. He's from Michigan. You got a choice between Michigan State and Bowie? Or Morgan? Where are you going? Especially if the price is right. Because one of the one of the popular stories we've had big time basketball players have a passing fancy with HBCUs. We've had John Wall, we had OJ Mayo, we've had a couple guys who who are flirting out there, or, you know, posting out there. I might go to an HBCU, and the story will go. And, I, and without naming any names, at some point somebody comes to your door, comes to your mom, and says, "What's the number? How much is it going to take to get your boy where he's supposed to be?" Is that on their end, as in on the potential recruits end, just a mechanism for them to get somebody to come to their door? It, but see, but see, but Tiffany, but Tiffany, and I Tiffany hate my to issue is cynical like that. But if you're poor and you know that you're your family's way out, and that's all you've heard and been seen, and that's been assessed of your talent, and you want to do something, is that what's being done? But here's where it has to start. If if this is a question of all things being equal to these athletes, I would I love everything about an HBCU, but you just don't have the facilities where I want to practice, where I want to play, because at this point, it's not even a question about coming on television. You're on ESPN and it's easy to get. So this isn't like, you you know, you know you're looking at a tape delay like you can watch most HBCU games at this point. Um, people will see you. People will find you. This is a, if this is if all things are, are are being considered equally. If this is a question of of resources, 
then when do we say, all right, well, if we want to play and we want to be big dog, then let's galvanize and, and put it in and get our gym and get our weight room and get our film room into work in order. Because I, truth be told, there are quite a few HBCUs that have decent facilities. Morgan has decent, more than decent. Morgan has good facilities. PV has amazing facilities. See what I mean? <laughs> like, so when you say like every, let, let me, let me, let me just debunk this myth. I'm going to be Ivory Tolson for a second. Oh, okay. Every, <laughs> every, every HBCU doesn't have whack facilities. There are some that have really dope weight rooms. There are some that have really dope playing fields. They we got really a, nice stadiums play. with lights. They come on TV locally and nationally with the ESPN deal. Every HBCU ain't trash when it comes to that. And so. and and we lead and and we lead the FCS. And even even you know even though again I'm not a big fan of the same D1 football, but we lead the FCS in attendance every year. Right. So, so ain't about people in the stands. There are way more people <laughs> in the stands. So if you think about it. It, it's more of a question of are it's not are you even are you pouring the resources into the facilities are you pouring the resources early enough into the right people to get the to get the coalitions that surround really good athletes to understand that HBCUs are a better option than another mid major. I think that we have this 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 misnomer or this wrong philosophy of we got to get a blue we got to get Zion or LeBron. I don't think you got it. That's not who you got to aim at. They're gonna go to where they're going to go you can get John Morant you can get it you can get a Draymond Green who who was a late bloomer and you know how we know it because we got a Tariq Cohen like in football so there there are if you Kyle can, if you get Kyle O'Quinn if you can get those guys who are good enough to be you know second team all city you know first team honorable mention when you're feasting on those that talent, then you're good to go. I think something is happening when you see all these NBA players and NBA veterans and retired NBA players giving money to HBCUs. They're starting golf programs at HBCUs like Steph Curry. They're doing combines, the SIAC and the SWAC doing a, a NBA combine. Um, more and more of these black athletes are starting to look at HBCUs. The question you have to ask is, are the HBCUs welcoming that attention are they reaching out to their agents are they reaching out to the players associations are they reaching out to their foundations and saying hey come be our come be our commencement speaker hey come you know come come take come bring your your your, your uh, summer camp here or are we just saying hey i'm so glad that you're wearing you know a winston-salem state sweatshirt like are are we taking it are we taking it to the next level to to broaden the relationship or are we just saying all right that's good that they're paying attention to us no you gotta you gotta you gotta call them you gotta reach out you gotta find a way to bridge that gap and keep them on your campus so i mean i mean i couldn't agree more i, I couldn't i couldn't agree I mean, at the same time are we do we do we do we care that's the that's the bigger question is that do do because at, at the same time we have great big fan bases and a lot of big, big states with the big sports teams, but we're not even. I don't. I don't think that we're engaged enough in those conversations. Um, you know, I know Morgan has a small deal with the Orioles and with the Ravens, um, but you know, will it go any further? Because at the same time, even with even back to recruiting, let's not forget, like we also. It also requires us to have relationships with these high schools. Mm. So those, those, the, those are the feeders in the pipeline. Right. I mean, you talk even even to bring it back to Detroit. What high school in Detroit you need to have a conversation with if you want to recruit for sports? It's Cass Tech in DC. You got the you know obviously you have Damascus, but you have the whole WCAC. In you know in Florida you have you know the Miami Dade schools. I mean, so th- there are I think also relations are a big point of that. At the same time. I mean, people like Juan Dixon was was third team all city and went to Maryland. Like, <laughs> I mean, so if 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 the Gary Williams sees value, maybe we should see some value too. Well, that, and I think that, that that's that's where things get older. That's to the point. I mean, it, and go ahead, Tiff. Could it also be misunderstanding or looking from the outside in on how these other D one PWIs 
get and maintain all of this attention. You know how like you see how somebody got something you think on how they may have gotten it and you deserve. So you just think it's going to be given to you. And not to say that it's not, not saying that we just think it's going to be handed to us, but I think it's more to what y'all have kind of been saying that what are you doing with this attention that you're being given in spurts? Like, are, are we acting on it? Do we have the people to act on it? Or is this like a Roland Martin situation where y'all need to hit me up? Drop me a line. Well, I, like, I, I think I, I, don't, it, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think it's Roland Martin. I, I think that's a bit extreme, but we don't have. So we have people who are are doing what they can to to cultivate the space. I think that we're just spread too thin. And I think Stephen Gaither's point, and he's made multiple times on HCU game days, should be taken into consideration in this whole conversation, which is, are we utilizing our resources efficiently? Right. Because we're we're spending a ton of money in student fees to be at the same place we've been in, regardless of how much exposure we have or not. Right. And I believe in outsourcing what can be outsourced to alum. Let's be very clear. If there is an alum. You realize that, you, you realize, you realize, so here's, here's the funny thing, right? Even about alumni, they talk about alumni giving rates, which I don't care about. You know why? I looked this up. Johns Hopkins alumni giving rate was 12%. Do you know what was in that 12% though? Right. A billion dollar a, donation. A billion dollar like, donation, right. <laughs> so, so we have to look at what is the side of the average donation because we don't have billion dollar donations coming in. So I, I'm not talking about money. Putting it, putting it on alumni is fine, but I mean, let's not, I never got to say you and they got, meet the, the band got a fine from the MEAC because they were on the field too long at halftime. <laughs> And they were walking around with buckets <laughs> asking for donations in the crowd because they had a $5,000 fine, oh okay? God. I'm not we ain't quitting back on alumni, I'm, trust I'm me. I'm talking about <laughs> you have alum who have a certain skill set. They have resources. You have a need, an extreme need. Why not ask somebody like Stephen Gaither in HBCU game day to take over what you need handled? Do, like does that make because, sense? Because 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 like, because the because the SWAT conference will come down and say no. In the same way that the government outsources to nonprofit organizations to decrease what it is that they what what it is that they're responsible for in terms of um, social services. That's I think what we need to consider doing as a community. We'll what talk about. We'll, we can we'll talk offline, Tiffany, but part of this is the NCAA conversation, which is in the ESPN having having exclusive streaming rights of all of our games yep. conversation because we can't outsource nothing. That's why I was going to say about if you talk to Stephen, he would love to, but ESPN has exclusive streaming rights of all HBCU content for the MEAC and the SWAC. And, and <laughs> we, the, we don't have to be NCAA. That's part of oh, okay, there you go. That's the conversation you know, nobody's ready to have. That's the that yeah, exactly. is the conversation nobody's <laughs> ready to have. My statement, there is something to be said about having more than one option is sticking with the one that's serving you the least amount. Yeah, serving you the least. And that and that's how we gotta end this one. No, nah, I'm not finished because you tried to cut me off. No, nah, you're, uh, <laughs> you're done. You're <laughs> done. So that's the conversation no one wants to have and, and we gotta have going forward. But when we come back, we wanna get to a um a serious issue um, that is playing out at several campuses and typically does year to year. How do we deal with uh, crime on campus? Uh, that just after dark. We'll be right back. That just after dark. Uh, hashtag family to the FBS. Um, so now we want to we want to talk about uh, a, a more serious uh, conversation, um, which is campus crime. Now, now here's one thing I want to say. I, you know we're not an outlet and we're not an operation that, that feeds off, you know, talking about crime on campus. Like we don't, that, that, those are hits I don't want um, because it's a stereotype that already follows us. So there's no read to no reason um, to analyze coverage of what happened on campus, who got hurt and how do we deal with it? But it is to say um, because that stereotype exists that we do have to have a conversation about some of the infrastructural approaches to how you solve this, right? So the reason I want to bring this up is because there was an article, I think it was the Chronicle, um, that that surfaced last week, I think during HBC week, that that kind of did a feature on the troubles that Morehouse College has had with hiring and retaining a Title IX officer. 
And this is in relation to the, you know, the ongoing narrative about, you know, sexual assault and harassment at Morehouse, um, where there's like a backlog of cases of uh, men being accused of, of rape um, and assault, uh, not just against women um, in the AUC, but also against other brothers on campus. There's a backlog of issues with uh, harassment from faculty and staff to students, some of which have resulted in. Uh, you know, students basically outing themselves, trying to find some kind of resolution yeah. to being harassed uh, by people on campus. So it is to say that HBCUs, not all of them, but enough of them, with some being the public facing representation of it, are having some real, real serious issues about how do you deal with campus crime? And I don't mean like somebody got robbed. I mean, claims processing the claims uh making sure that due process is followed what level does administration have or responsibility does administration have in oversight of these things how do you keep certain positions filled when the backlog is so much and the work is so much and the culture is so intertwined with we don't want to deal with this how do you make that happen? And and I think all of our schools have dealt dealt with that. Howard, Morgan, FAMU, all of us have dealt with this. HBC all over the country. So to the Morehouse point first, the story pretty much centered on there were several sisters who had been hired at the Title IX officer. They they quit. For one reason, too much work. I'm one person. These are way too many cases for me to process. Another one was the notion that being a sister in the position you were naturally and overwhelmingly surrounded by a bunch of brothers it's morehouse college so in administration the only people with whom you're you're dealing with on a regular basis is men and what does that mean in communication in being taken seriously in uh, making sure that your voice is heard that's morehouse um but it is it could be a reflection for a lot of campuses that are dealing with this so I would pose to you guys, how serious of an issue do you think campus crime is? And do you think that of the HBCUs with which you are intimately familiar, that they are doing a good and effective job of dealing with issues like that on campus? You want me to start, Tiffany, or you want to go first? Oh, no, you got this. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, obviously I went to two HBCUs, one in a college town in Tallahassee, one in a very urban environment in Baltimore, and I live across the street from a from an urban HBCU and TSU now. And I grew up near Howard or damn near on the campus, um, which is an urban environment as well. I think the first thing we, we don't talk about enough is that a lot of our campuses, um, our campus police are only allowed to police a very small area of the campus. So, for instance, in Baltimore, Morgan police can't cross Hill and Road. Like, they can't do anything, even in Morgan View, which is has name Morgan on it, <laughs> but even though it's private property, technically. I'm praying that they've Baltimore changed that. City. I'm praying that they have changed that. <laughs> Please say they have changed that. I hope <laughs> they have some kind of cooperative agreement where Morgan police can be over there, because if not, oh, my gosh. When I was in school, as, as a, when I was living in Baltimore, going to Morgan State, um, they didn't have jurisdiction over half of Marble Hall. So I had friends who lived in Marble Hall, the non-Morgan part of it. Mm -hmm. That was Baltimore City Police. Morgan View was Baltimore City Police. I actually had a friend get arrested inside inside Morgan View by Baltimore City Police, inside of Morgan View, Morgan View Apartments. Mm -hmm. Long story. Mm -hmm. but, um, <laughs> but, yeah, so you talk about such a small area of the campus community is policed by our police department. So you talk about jurisdiction, you talk about processing and claims. It's a very hazy, at least in my opinion, very hazy cooperation between the cities in which they operate in and the overall uh, campus community. I didn't see that in Tallahassee, though. At, at FAMU, it, seems like it was a very much like the FAMU police had the FAMU, the general area. It wasn't a, It wasn't like a clear distinction where you would see you know, Tallahassee police right across the street. It was more of a, a holistic environment, but it's also a college town. In D.C., I rarely see Howard University police. I mean, you may see them on, obviously on the campus, 
but they're not on Georgia Avenue. They're not on Florida Avenue. They're right. not nowhere down you. Mm-hmm. So I think I think in my in my opinion, we talk about jurisdiction. We talk about Title Nine. We talk about all these all these different things. I think it all comes down to the fact that we are under resourced in our crime prevention and um, and our safety edifice because of our campus size, but also we don't necessarily have the jurisdiction to go a little bit further out, which is where many students live. And then the third thing about that is that in some cases, we don't have the best relationship with the communities that surround the school. Uh-huh. You can. So I guess from a university budget perspective, there are times where you can allocate resources and say, all right, we want more police cars or we want to hire more officers. Or we want more technology on campus like cameras and, um, you know, keyless entry uh and id cards and stuff like that so there are things that you can do on an annual basis to say we're going to strengthen our public safety approach but i wonder if those things are effective if students believe that there is a culture of things happening and students being able to get away with it because i i one of the one of the dirty little secrets of of hbcus or at least as i've come to know them let's say you get caught smoking weed on campus typically the, you know you're not you're supposed to be thrown out for that typically the police won't prosecute you and say you need to you need to be expelled even though there's drug use on except campus the, except the UMS <laughs> no, you know, that's that's right out on the shore they'll, they'll get you out you're on you're on 13 but, um, so. but some students believe that's not fair and I don't feel safe because you're allowing drug use on campus so there's a now you have a culture for what a lot of people would say is a minor offense, but some students feel like I'm not I'm not safe because if you're smoking drugs on campus, does that mean somebody's dealing drugs on campus? So th- that's how, you know that's one notion of culture. It's another thing about drinking. Um, you know, some people you know everybody has had known somebody or is or has done themselves like snuck liquor into the dorm. If you got a dry campus like Morgan is, that was nothing you know from Haven Lounge over to Rollins Hall. But that, that some people may feel like, OK, you're drinking and drunk on campus. Is uh, what is there going to be an assault here? What if you get in a fight? What if you get in a fight and you got a gun or a knife and you're drunk? So I, I think a big part of this conversation is students feeling like they're either committing minor offenses and it's OK because it's a minor offense. And then other students feeling like this ain't safe here, because when something big happens, they recall all those minor offenses. And when it comes to. You know, when they get on Twitter or when they get on the local media, they say, oh, man, we got a lot of problems here. Um, I think there's something to be said about how we and how how we consider ourselves a community and how we allow um, our students current and, you know, alone to regard our community and how we are to treat each other. Um, because you should not. You should not get a pass. There should be some type of consequence. So, you know don't violate violate this particular community norm again but i think we do a good job i don't know if that's because we ain't got the resources we're in a state of dysfunction but we do a good job of giving people passes or slaps on the wrist because we we just don't have the manpower we don't and we don't want to see them caught up and to, and there you go the that's that's what i was waiting for we don't want to see them caught up because that's and, the but, that's the but refrain you that's granted though and I, and I mean, I, and I think about Rosita and Walter. Let me or any of my brothers have gotten caught up smoking weed in our res hall or getting drunk and, and having to go to the hospital to get our stomach pumped or anything like that. They're here and on our ass. Did you ever stay? Did you, were you ever on George Avenue drunk? Yes or no? No, I don't get drunk outside of safe environments. <laughs> outside of the residence hall but anyway uh, so <laughs> you know what <laughs> <laughs> so i mean i was i was def i was definitely drunk multiple times on Wander's way i was great. <laughs> walking yeah i mean so it, it is what it is I but just, i think i think you know, Tiffany, like, you have, you have I would, a good I point willingly and willfully put myself in that position i'm not right. getting drunk out of my home I, understand. I, I don't you have a you have a good point but from what my experience i never saw anybody get the pass at morgan or fam I had multiple friends get arrested by by Morgan and FAMU police for a very minor thing. I had a friend get kicked out of UMES for some residue. So maybe back in Jared's day, and I'm not saying you're that much older than me, maybe back in your day it was a bit cooler. But now, when I was in school, 
I had multiple people get kicked out <laughs> for 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 what what I, what I would consider minor minor offenses. And it's crazy because in Maryland it's all legal now. Well, it's not legal; it's decriminalized now. See, that's the that's the challenge though, because officer to officer, chief to chief, VP to VP, president to president, they all have differing views of that, and that's okay on your individual campus. But what happens when that's on the same campus? What happens when a Title IX officer believes, okay, I, I've got a claim of of a sexual assault. The 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 victim provides this information the accused provides this information and I don't have the time or the resources to investigate friends to investigate acquaintances and all that stuff and so this comes back based on what I have and what I have time for inconclusive and now you have an issue where students are saying "Uh uh-uh such and such was raped and you're coming back inconclusive and that dude is still or that person is still on the campus, the, 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 the attacker. No way. No way. And now you have a, 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 a situation where students are compelled to say, I'm going to go on Twitter or Instagram and out that person and out myself as a victim and out the university as as unresponsive or non-responsive or complicit with an attack. And we've not even we've not even gotten to all the levels of how does this happen? And now people's lives are permanently altered and a school is dragged through the news nationally because every time this happens with Morehouse and Spelman, they're in the news nationally in multiple outlets. It ain't just the Atlanta journal constitution. This is time magazine. This is New York times. This is the Washington post. So this is a national story. And at what point do you say how do how do we effectively handle this? And we're just talking about sexual assaults. We're not even talking about violence on campus. We're not talking about weapons. We're not talking about fights. We're not talking about uh, burglary and property destruction. If we just focus on sexual assault and broke down, how do we get here? And when you compound that, there's a culture of students really don't know what due process is. <laughs> They don't they don't, I don't. And it's not that they're 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 not intelligent enough to know. It's not that it's not explained to them. I think that they get caught up in the emotion of it. When I when I think about the A&T case where the cheerleader was sexually assaulted and the people were outing the attacker, he's, he's still on campus. Get him out of here. That's a you know, when you talk about Title nine, that's a lawsuit. You throw him off campus and he hasn't had due process. He hasn't been found responsible. He hasn't been found criminally responsible. That school is about to have a problem. Because you didn't give a student legitimately charged or not due process, but from a student I mean, perspective, we all saw we all saw Morgan lost that lawsuit over the over the shooting. Right. See what I mean? So when <laughs> this due, due process, <laughs> when you when you talk about when you talk about resources, that's a challenge. But it's even more of a challenge when the schools don't make it clear timetables requirements of of cooperation from witnesses requirements of cooperation from claimants um counseling resources you just you, you know a student makes a claim and they say okay well, well you know, i appreciate that you need to go to the doctor okay well are you okay to go back to class that ain't that ain't good enough that's not good enough that's how you get people on on instagram saying my name is such and such and i was raped by this person now you got a whole bunch of legal issues. Now the school has a whole bunch of legal issues. Now the school has a whole bunch of media coverage. How do we reverse that? How, I, I, don't, I don't. If you don't have enough people and you don't have enough time and you have a growing number of incidents, real or real or false, whatever, you still have to investigate all of them comprehensively. Is there a way that you can reverse this? Because you can put more money into your budget. But if your people don't have the training, if your people think like this is too much, I can't do all these cases at one time and I'm not sure who's lying or who's not. And, and everybody has this thing like I'm not snitching on somebody and I don't really want to throw a black man or a black woman out of school. We got it. We got a real cauldron of issues that's mm-hmm. only going to get worse. And I think at some point somebody got to Somebody got to offer a blueprint to get out of this because this is happening at too many campuses. And it's happening too frequently. 
And ultimately, it'll be the point, as with everything else, it ain't just one school. It ain't just Morehouse. It's HBCUs. HBCUs got a problem with rape. HBCUs got a problem with guns. HBCUs got a problem with drugs. So, I mean, from... from and, in, the, and in all actuality, we don't. That's the sad part that we don't. We don't have the... We don't, we don't have the resources to even combat it, even from a PR perspective. Like, we don't have... When these articles come out, we don't have the ability to even respond to them in an effective way. Don't even get me started on that. How many how many times <laughs> where something happens and the and the, the thing says Morehouse officials or Morgan State officials were unavailable for comment? We need <laughs> a ghostwriting PR oh my God. you alumni <laughs> guild. <laughs> No, for real. Like we keep talking about what we don't have, but I know we got people. <laughs> we do. We. But, but, do. but do, can we can can we pay their rate? Can we afford it? Can, can y'all ask me if y'all ask me to contract? I ain't low. I ain't did, did no guess. Ain't no get no discount. Exactly. I'm no. saying on discount. And why? And why? And why should you? Because the work is that serious, and the work is that. I, I agree with you. If there's money somewhere. It all depends on how you want to allocate the it, money. Is there money do. somewhere, Tiffany? There's yeah, money. Where, where at? It just depends on how you want to allocate the money. Is there money somewhere? You would know better than anybody. Is there money somewhere? There's money somewhere. I don't think so. And that's going <laughs> to wrap. That's going to wrap. Wait till we get off. Wait till we get off. <laughs> and that's going to wrap up our conversation. I mean, I mean in all seriousness. Um, there is money somewhere. Tiffany doesn't have it. Her department doesn't have it. But uh, there is money somewhere that you can reallocate. Um, it's just a question of are we willing to put the training in and are we willing to bring the students in in mass to help them understand here's where we are in our ability to process claims and crimes. And here's your responsibility as a citizen of this community in understanding due process, helping us to execute it and making sure that we're not jeopardizing the futures of other people who may not have been involved or who you may not have the whole story and all kinds of stuff. We just got to have, we got, it has to start with a cultural change before you even get to the resource question. So really good show, man. I appreciate it. Tiffany didn't get thrown off or thank you brother as usual. Um, and thank all of you out there for listening uh, for this edition of Digest at the Dark again. You can catch us on uh, patreon.com forward slash HBCU Digest. Please be sure to subscribe. Just a dollar a month. Our lowest our lowest package. Also check us out on uh, Sirius 142 HBCU, Pride of Howard University Radio Network. Uh, until next tip, we doing this again next week? We're doing this tomorrow. Stop playing. I'm not doing it tomorrow. I'm boycotting tomorrow. Thanks again, everybody, for listening. Digest at the Dark. Take it next time. Peace.